These confounded video games are great and everything, but no matter how realistic they become, it's still just you on a couch behind some buttons. Don't you wish there was a way to somehow jump inside that video game and be a part of it, interacting with everything? Well, how's about we sell our way back machines to 1992 where a certain kid's game show allowed you to do just that. And after we're done listening to our Color Me Bad cassettes and watching the latest episode of Blossom, we'll take a look at Nickelodeon's gift to video game fanatics everywhere. Nick Arcade on today's cynical episode of Parker Lewis Can't Lose. He cannot lose. Premiering in 1977 as Pinwheel for the short-lived Cube interactive television service in Columbus, Ohio, Nickelodeon graduated to full-fledged cable network on April 1, 1979. The network's start was inauspicious to say the least, with only Pop Clips, a music video show created by ex-monkey Michael Nesmith that was a precursor of sorts to MTV, serving as one of the only memorable standouts. Within a few years, the network began generating buzz with shows like You Can't Do That on Television and Mr. Wizard's World. But it would take a game show for Nickelodeon to get a seat at the adult table at the Cable Ace Award Banquet Dinner. On your mark, get set, go! Double Dare premiered on Nickelodeon on October 6, 1986. Within a month, it had triple Nickelodeon's audience. Its combination of trivia and wacky stunts proved popular not only with kids, but also viewers well outside the network's demographics, such as college students. With Double Dare's success came a renewed interest in game shows for the prepubescent, a genre barely explored since the Joker's wild spin-off ceased production in 1981. The late 80s saw several new entries into this genre, most of them airing, at least initially, on Nickelodeon. These include Finders Keepers, Make the Grade, and Think Fast to name but a few. Good morning, it's Sunday, August 13th, and in just a few moments, some members of our studio audience will go through massive amounts of oatmeal in ways that will really wake you up for Nickelodeon's Total Panic! In 1989, Nickelodeon premiered a once-weekly three-hour variety show called Total Panic. Airing typically on Sunday mornings, the show was a mixture of stunts, on-location stories, video game news, and wacky contests. Two contributors to the show were longtime friends James Bethia and Kareem Maitif. Working on Total Panic afforded them access to Nickelodeon studio assets. Here they discovered a program called Mandala that ran off a of Commodore Amiga. The Mandela program is a perfect example of multimedia. The camera shoots the hand, which triggers computer events, in this case, MIDI instruments. Created by Vincent John Vincent and Francis McDougal in 1986, Mandala was an early virtual reality program that would turn chroma key video, such as a person standing against a green screen, into an object that can interact with digitally rendered assets, complete with collision detection. Recording artist Dean Friedman, who had a minor hit with the 1977 song Ariel, Ariel. also became intimate with Mandala's capabilities. With his company, InVideo, he developed a simple game called Eat a Bug that had players physically grab at digital insects while avoiding baddies. The game was licensed to Nickelodeon for use on Bethia and Mytiff's produced Total Panic segments. Nickelodeon viewers would glimpse one of the earliest examples of this new form of televised virtual reality. And from what I remember, it was probably the most interesting part of the show. While Total Panic only lasted a year, Bethia and MyTiff's contributions to the show gave them an opportunity to present new ideas to Nickelodeon. The duo initially pitched another variety show, more or less a clone of Total Panic, but entirely based around video games. The main attraction would be more Mandala VR games, except bigger and more exciting. Nickelodeon politely passed on this idea. They still wanted game shows. While initially dejected, the duo soon realized that the technology may work better in the confines of a traditional, televised contest. With Friedman's in-video working on new games, and a lot of studio area set aside for blue screens, 
The seeds had been planted for Nickelodeon Arcade, or Nick Arcade if you're nasty. There were several ideas for how the show was going to work on television. Originally, the duo wanted Mandala's software to run the entire length of the show before realizing that might prove problematic. They opted for an easier to manage front game that combined trivia, puzzles, and popular video games while saving the VR for the grand finale. The next challenge was finding the right host. For the job, they turned to a warm-up comic for MTV's remote control going by the name Fillmore. His quick wit and fun personality proved to be a perfect fit for Nick Arcade, although they did ask him to go by his original name, Phil Moore. With all the pieces in place, taping for Nick Arcade began in December of 1991 at Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando, Florida. The show premiered on January 4th, 1992. Get ready for the ultimate video challenge! Nick Arcade had two teams of two face off in a points-based competition. These points were earned through various games and events over two rounds. Each round starts off with a simplistic head-to-head -to -head toss up game. These proprietary games, running off the Commodore Amiga, were developed by Bethia and Mytiff's production company with some assistance by veteran Amiga game publisher Psygnosis. Despite the Amiga's coat of paint, the face-off games were nothing more than dolled up renditions of simplistic first and second generation video games like Pong. During the main game, both teams are responsible for guiding an avatar named Mikey through random backdrops, one square at a time, in an effort to reach the goal. Behind each square is one of several surprises. First off, you have what Fillmore refers to playfully as the 4 P's. Points, which is basically a no strings attached score boost. Pop Quiz, a toss up general knowledge question somewhat related to the theme of Mikey's board. Prizes, often of dubious value, but which the players get to keep regardless of the outcome of the game. And Puzzles, comma, video. Or just video puzzles. The video puzzles took various forms but were much like the pop quizzes in that both teams competed to score the points and gain control of Mikey. Over the course of the show's run, there would be about a dozen different video puzzles. Right there, Bean Brain. Some spaces contained an enemy that would abuse Mikey in some comical way. There were different enemies based on the theme of the board, but the outcome was always the same. Some quick animation, a lost turn, and control turned over to their opponents. The best spots, at least for the viewer, were the video challenges. If you've ever seen Starcade, or at least my episode on the show, you're already familiar with this event. Players decide which game out of five they'd like to attempt, so long as it hasn't already been played. One player has to attempt to beat a predetermined value with a 30 second time limit. Before starting, the other player wagers part of their score based on how much or little confidence they have in their partner, using what appears to be a magna doodle. 30 seconds, ready, set, go. Okay. He's gotta get 25, he's at the four. Plenty, old time. He is at nine seconds, eight, seven. Oh, he lost them all. I don't know, it doesn't look too bad. What? If they fail to beat the challenge, points are lost and control passes to the other team. The cabinets featured various games from the NES, Super NES, Sega Genesis, TurboGrafx-16, and even Neo Geo. Although there were some sleeper hits in there, Nick Arcade did have the distinction of showcasing a prototype build of Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Obviously, only games that had visible scorekeeping were used. And he's taking a trip to... The round always ends on a quiz question, either when a team makes it to the goal or a round time expires and he's thrust there automatically. Once bonus points are awarded, the teams move on to round two. Round two is played exactly like round one, except for double the points. The team with the most points moves on to the video zone. The object of the video zone was for the team to complete three levels and defeat the day's boss character, the Wizard Murloc, the Sorceress Scorcia, or the Warrior Mongo, in 60 seconds. Well, there he is set. Hey, Terrence, hit start and go! Each team member takes turns completing the first two rooms, in which they need to collect three items to clear. Various hazards will deplete their energy, and if it's completely empty, they have to hit an icon to restart the current level. On the third level, both members help to collect the orbs that will defeat the day's main antagonist. Completing this task within the time limit will award them the day's grand prize, usually a trip. Though it was far more common for the contestants to fail hard. What, what, what was seems to be uh, giving you the problem in the uh, museum? 
Which is really hard. Which is really hard. <laughs> Nick Arcade, despite its video game theme, pulls off the game show genre surprisingly well. I have previously remarked that Starcade, this show's spiritual predecessor, locked out casual viewers with obscure questions on video game lore while focusing heavily on arcade play that may be too confusing for non-fans. Nick Arcade, meanwhile, is a lot more accessible, with general trivia questions and puzzles dominating the front game, no video game knowledge required. And I will say the home consoles are so much easier, production-wise, since there are no non-standard arcade monitors that had to be dealt with. Broadcasting the action was as simple as splitting the feed from the console, translating to easy-to-follow action for the home viewer. Finally, I need to give props to host Phil Moore. After spending some time with the show, I can't think of anyone else at the helm. He's gonna disappear, he's gonna be... BAM! There it is, all right. Phil possessed the energy and exuberance necessary to move the show along at a healthy pace. He meshed well with the young contestants and appeared to be genuinely interested in them performing well. Though he did have one very odd quirk. The tune's an earworm. I dig that song. That's not to say Nick Arcade is without faults. Indeed, the show's accessibility for even non-video game fans that I mentioned earlier may have had a downside. It was evident that video games were not familiar territory for more than a few players, some of them button mashing so wildly they inadvertently paused the game. And then there's the video zone. Yeah, in hindsight it was kind of a hot mess. There's nothing graceful about the contestants awkwardly pawing at empty space while trying to determine their position on some strategically placed monitors, all the while dodging arbitrary hazards that left little room for error. Since the players had a health meter, Brute Force often won over Nimble Evasion when it came to effective Grand Prize winning strategies. But still, for 1992, on a basic cable show, it was still impressive, even if the contestants were fumfering around all confused like some drunk teenager trying to find his way home. A total of 82 episodes of Nick Arcade were produced, all aired in 1992 across two seasons, with reruns until 1997. Episodes also aired on Nick Gas, with an annoying logo covering up the action because Viacom hates you and everything you love. Even after Nick Arcade wrapped, the peripheralist virtual reality technology used therein lived on. Dean Friedman's InVideo licensed many of their games, including Eat a Bug from Total Panic, to several museums and amusement centers around the world. And while a far cry from the dedicated blue painted sets on Nick Arcade, it was still a novel crowd pleaser especially with kids. In 2003, this brand of augmented virtuality started appearing in homes with the release of the iToy for the PlayStation 2, and then later the more advanced Kinect for the Xbox 360 in 2010. But while revolutionary, it never succeeded in changing the way we played. Video game characters are capable of actions no human can ever replicate. Using your own body as an in-game character meant that action had to be dialed back. A lot of the games that worked with these home interactive cameras were simple swat at something type games, or non-complicated sports like bowling. Funny how technology advances. Something that was previously only possible with $35,000 worth of equipment became a novelty that gets bought and sold at garage sales for a few bucks. After Nick Arcade, Fillmore went on to host Nickelodeon's You're On in 1999. James Bathia, meanwhile, produced several red carpet events for E! while Kareem Maitif works as a sales accountant manager for a video production outfit. All three of them would reunite, along with Nick Arcade announcer Andrea Lively, for a new show idea that would have taken Nick Arcade to the next level, or the nth level as they put it. Nth level would have pitted teams against each other in several gaming related challenges, involving both modern titles and retro classics. The winning team would be outfitted with full-on virtual reality outfits, having them face off against more lifelike, computer-generated foes. Viewers at home would be able to watch the show the traditional way, or by using their consumer-level virtual reality gear to witness the action from the same vantage point as the contestants. 
Moore, Bethia and Mytiff brought this idea to Kickstarter with an initial goal of $350,000 just to get the idea off the ground, with stretch goals of $1.25 million and $2.75 million for further production. The Kickstarter ended on June 4th, 2015 with only a little over $3,000 raised. Nth Level's Facebook and Twitter accounts have remained silent ever since. That one concludes on kind of a bummer. Anyway, this was Day for TV Games. Please help control the pet population by having your pets like, comment, and subscribe. And as usual, see you next time. Aww. Now.